Today we're in chapter 36. We're going to be looking at a very, I think, um, a great portion of Scripture. Um, we're going to be looking at what really deals with the conversion of the nation of Israel. And so let's begin reading together at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 1 through 7. We're looking at the conversion of the nation of Israel. We read, And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said of you, Aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. And you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Eden, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country. Therefore, prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath, and surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. Chapter 36. Chapter 36 of the book of Ezekiel gives us wonderful promises, and we'll see this in a few minutes, wonderful promises to the nation of Israel. The nation has gone through much suffering, as we've been seeing all through Ezekiel up to this point. It's gone through much suffering. But God has made a promise, and His promise is very simple. In the future, God is saying, I will restore you. And also, in the future, God is saying, we just read this, I'm going to be judging those nations that have caused you pain, and once again, I'm going to be blessing you. Now, that's what chapter 36 deals with. Now, in order for this to take place, and we'll see this in a few moments, in order for this blessing to take place, there has to be what is called a spiritual regeneration that needs to happen. As a nation... They are to be transformed, and they're to be transformed by a genuine faith in God. And when that takes place, the blessings of God are going to pour out upon them. You'll see that when we pick up at verse 24. You're going to see how that works out in just a moment. But in order for us to understand this chapter, we need to know that these are promises that are given that are literal and that they will be literally fulfilled. In other words, there's a literal land of Israel, there's a little, literal regeneration that they're to undergo, and there's a literal kingdom that they will be ruled under that is ruled by Messiah. And so chapter 36 speaks of the conversion of the nation of Israel, and you're going to see this as we go through the chapter. Now, the first 15 verses of chapter 36 actually ties in to chapter 35. It's really a continuation of the prophecy that we began to look at last time when we saw God speaking a word of judgment against the nation of Edom. And so as he picks up in verse 1 here in chapter 36, and it says here, Son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. As we pick up there, Israel is speaking now to the nation of Israel. And he's basically saying to them that they need to understand the future of God or God's future plans for them. These mountains that are spoken of here in verse 1, mountains of Israel, are really representative of the whole nation. It speaks of the people of Israel as well as the, the geographic reality of the fact that there are a series of mountains there in the nation. And, and he's saying to them that God wants to do something, and so you need to listen. When he says here, he's saying here what is uh, concerning the things that God wants to do. God is going to judge your enemies, he's saying, and God is going to bless you. So hear what he has to say. Verse 2, thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has said of you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Your enemies, in other words, have rejoiced over your suffering. Your enemies think that this land has become theirs because the land has been abandoned, or at least it appears that it has. 
And so your enemies are rejoicing right now because they think the land has been abandoned and therefore they can take it as they desire. These ancient heights that he's speaking about there are, are the hills. It speaks of the hills surrounding the, uh, or within the nation of Israel. It speaks specifically of the city of Jerusalem. It speaks also of the Temple Mount because the nation of Israel had a series of hills. Jerusalem was a higher elevation and the Temple Mount was higher, uh, the highest point there in in the city of Jerusalem. So he's speaking of these ancient heights and he's saying that they think that they're going to take possession of a desolate land because the Jews are in exile. But he's saying that's not the truth. That's not what's going to happen because, verse 3, he says, prophesy. He says to them, prophesy, thus says the Lord God, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations you are taken up by the lips of, of talkers and slandered by the people. Therefore, mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that have become forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Thus says the Lord God, I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country. Even as the nation is lying there apparently abandoned, the enemy intends for Israel to remain desolate. They believe that they're now in full control of Israel. Edom especially believed that. They believed that they were going to occupy the nation of Israel. There are other nations there that had not been taken yet by, by Babylon that would be spoken of. There would be Ammon and Moab as well as the Philistines. And so there's a lot of talk that's taking place right now. As a matter of fact, the Lord speaks in verse 3 uh, concerning the lips of talkers. In other words, people were talking about how Israel was abandoned and, and they were defaming her. They were speaking poorly of her because when, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the people who would come by would actually look at her and mock that city. If you take notes, there's a, an Old Testament book called Lamentations. It was written by the prophet Jeremiah. And in, in Lamentations chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, we, we get some insight into this. Your prophets have seen you, seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. All who pass by clap their hands at you. They hiss and shake their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that is called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All your enemies have opened their mouth against you. They hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Surely this is the day we have waited for, we have found it, we have seen it. Well, that's what's being spoken of here. These are the lips of talkers. They're speaking about how Israel is abandoned. The Edomites believe that they're going to now possess that, that beautiful city and that nation. And so in verses 4 and 5, God takes note of this, and He begins to speak to them. He, he takes note of the land. He speaks of the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the wastes, the forsaken, the plundered cities. And he says that he's burning with jealousy. In other words, I'm committed to you. I love you. And, and I'm moved by your, your situation. He speaks of the, the emotions of the enemies, that they had joy and spite. They were enjoying her suffering. And they think they're going to possess and plunder what belongs to Israel, but is in reality occupied by God. And so God speaks to them in this way. And he says in verse 6, Prophesy concerning the land of Israel, say to the mountains, Chino Hills, the rivers, and Chino Valley. No, he doesn't say that. That's my notes. He says, say to all of these places, thus says the Lord God, behold, I've spoken in my jealousy and my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. I want to make a promise to you, God is saying, I want you to know that your enemies are going to be dealt with. I want you to know that they are going to reap what they have sown. I want you to know that they are going to experience what they themselves have done to you as a nation. 
And God says, and I'm raising my hand. In, in other words, I'm making a promise, a solemn pledge. I'm making this oath. They will bear their own shame. They will be dealt with. And I want you to know that as a just God, I'm doing this because of how they have treated you, but I'm doing this because their behavior is sinful. When he says in verse 8, but you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches that yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. Indeed, I am for you. I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. The cities shall be inhabited, the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast. They shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I'm the Lord. Yes, I will cause men to walk on you, my people Israel. They shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour men and bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nation any more, says the Lord God. Nor will I let you hear the taunts of the nations anymore, nor bear the reproach of the peoples anymore, nor shall you cause your nation to stumble anymore, says the Lord God. The land is barren, but the land is going to be populated. The land is barren, but the land is going to prosper. The land is barren, but God is going to bring peace to those people. Now, this is a picture of the distant future, not the immediate future. You need to understand that. This is speaking of the little, little, literal restoration of the nation of Israel beyond the geographic realities of what we experience today in the 21st century. This goes beyond that. What we see right now in the repopulation, resettlement, and reestablishment of the nation of Israel is really what is called a foretaste of future things. And so what the Lord is speaking about here is really going to be applied to the time that the nation of Israel is under the rulership of Jesus, their Messiah. That's what you're seeing here in the book of Ezekiel. See, in the future, God is going to do this work. Israel is going to be productive. It's going to be repopulated because it's going to be prepared for the Messiah, Jesus. And it's going to take some time. And one of the things we need to remember that God, is that God has a different sense of time than we do, and there's no doubt about that. I mean, when you look into 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, the apostle said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God's sense of time is different than yours and mine. We want things done immediately, but God is willing to take the longer look at time and all. And so God is giving promises to Ezekiel that are yet future, yet to the Lord they're still soon. Because in the pale of things, when you look at eternity and in, in, in the process of time, you know, the time between his speaking here in Ezekiel and his fulfillment really isn't that a great time. So God is saying, listen, I'm going to do a work here. I'm going to do a work in the land. Now, ultimately, Jesus, Messiah, is going to rule and he's going to reign. And under him, the nation is once again going to be blessed. Uh, notice in verses 14 and 15, he's speaking concerning, uh, you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nation anymore, nor will I let you hear the taunts of the nations anymore, nor bear the reproach of the peoples anymore, nor shall you cause your nation to stumble anymore. When he's speaking uh, at that point, he's speaking of when Jesus is ruling here for the thousand years, that is called the millennial reign. And what's going to take place is God, God is going to be doing a great work. You see, in verse 3, when it says, you devour men and bereave your nation of children, therefore, in verse 14, you shall devour men no more. Life, the period of life that we have, the length of life, the length of days that we have are actually going to be increased. Not necessarily uh, you and me, because that's a different subject entirely, those who are alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are alive during the millennial rule of Christ, those people, and especially in context, Ezekiel chapter 36, dealing with the Jewish nation, he's simply saying to the Jews, you are going to have long life. There was a time when you died early, but when Messiah is ruling and reigning and you are under his rule, you're going to have long life. 
And the only ones who are going to be dying are going to be those who really haven't come to a faith in Christ because, indeed, during the millennial rule, there will be people alive at that time who, though they're ruled by Jesus, have never bowed their knee in terms of faith. It's an amazing thing, but the Bible is very clear about that. When you read Isaiah, for example, another prophet, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20, listen to what he says. He says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Meaning the ones who die at the age of 100 are dying because they have no relationship with God, therefore violate something and end up dying. So during this time when Jesus is ruling and reigning in that thousand-year period, the world is going to be under the most beautiful relationship because Jesus himself will be ruling and reigning and people will be living long lives under his rule and reign. Now, I'll show you a few things in just a moment about that. But notice in verse 15 when he says, nor will I let you hear the taunts of the nations anymore, nor bear the reproach of the people. Instead of being taunted because of how God is working in this nation, how God has brought them restored them, repopulated, brought them peace, blessed them because they're going to see that God is with them, the people will no longer be taunting the faith. Just now we were looking at that uh, video of Brett Hume and how that Brett Hume had stated that Tiger Woods in his Buddhist faith is not finding what he really needs. That's a very strong statement, by the way, and we know that. And to say that he believes that Jesus Christ, Christian faith, offers to him what he's not getting in Buddhism was a very strong statement to make. I mean, I bless the Lord for somebody who's willing to stand up on TV in front of millions and make that comment and not be a preacher in the sense of a pastor teacher. As a matter of fact, I'll go so far as to say that there are pastor teachers who would not have been so bold as that man. And so I thank God for men like that. Would to God that we were all like that, that we would speak openly of our faith. Amen. And so what happens? Well, if you read what is being in the firestorm that that created, where people are calling him names and all, and I read some of the, the statements that were, that were made concerning that comment and the anger. Indeed, he's right. It's true. You see, when you have a walk with God, when you really believe the gospel, when you really put into practice the faith of Christ, when you're really serious about that, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, and you know this, you will be taunted. I guarantee you, there will be people angry at you. I, there's no doubt about it. Friends and family members, close friends will reject you because that's what the Lord taught. Jesus taught us, listen, when you get right with God and you're really serious about it, your friends have a problem with that. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. I lost most of my friends. I lost every friend who wasn't converted. We'll put it that way. Because when I started sharing with them that they needed the Lord Jesus Christ, when I began to say to them, and I came right out of the same mud that they were in, I said, listen, you know what? Jesus Christ can transform your life. Jesus Christ will forgive you of your sins. Jesus can give you what you need. People got really uptight with me. My friends rejected me. And, and it was something I did not get surprised about. Jesus taught us that that was going to take place. In, in Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And that's what happens. You know what trips... I'm sorry, that's probably not a proper word. What um, really amazes me? What trips me out <laughs> is how people can get so uptight and, and, and we back down. Now, I'm not saying go out and throw your chest out there and start a fight on the work side. I'm not saying that. That's not what we're called to do. But and I'm telling you, we, I don't know how to put this. How do you put this? Um, we just have to get a spiritual backbone. Listen, I, I don't know if it was unique to my time. I do not think it was. All I know is that I got saved as a 20-year-old hippie. I already was hated by society. They already hated me. 
They didn't like those long hairs, dopers, barefooted freaks. They didn't like us. So what do I care if they don't like me now? I, it just, it never, it just, it just, there was something that never bothered me. Okay, don't like me, don't like me. You don't want to like, don't like me. I wish you liked me. I really do. I want everybody to like me. I'm no different than anybody else. Yeah, I'd love to be popular. And yet, I discovered that the Lord said, uh, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. So I've discovered a long time ago that when you take a stand and say, listen, I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, you may not. It's between you and the Lord, but I do. I believe his word is true. I believe his promises are firm. I believe that God transforms people, and I believe that the Holy Spirit can empower me to live for him. I believe that God can give me love, joy, peace, and satisfaction in life now. I believe that God can give me those things because those things come from God. And the way to have those things is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I believe that before I was a pastor. I believe that. That's what made me a Christian, you see. And so simply believing that is what got me saved. And it's a production of salvation. Those things are more firm in my life now, 39 years later, than they were the day I got saved. But the bottom line, it was true then, it's true now. And yet we have people who are afraid that people won't eat lunch with them at school. They're, they're not going to be the cool person anymore. They're going to say, oh, that person, they're going to use some kind of derogatory comment about them. And, and they get so quiet and they get so hurt and they're so, they get hurt so easy. We have to toughen up. We have to toughen up as, as a church. We do. I mean, okay, if you don't like me, I'm sorry. I wish you liked me. I really do. If you don't like me because of Jesus, that's fine. That's fine. Now, if you don't like me because I'm a jerk, I'm sorry I'm a jerk. You see, there are two offenses, the offenses of the cross and the offense of the personality. If I offend with my personality, forgive me. I'm sorry. That's who I am, but I shouldn't have done that. I am so sorry. But if it's because of Jesus Christ that you're offended, I am not sorry. I'm not. I'm sorry that you don't know Christ. I want you to know him. I want you to love him. I want you to have the things that God gives. But if my telling you the truth has offended you, take it to God. Complain to him. Tell him, tell him, God, you're wrong. I don't believe. Talk to him about it. But why take it out on his messengers? See, the bottom line is, guys, is the church has to get a backbone. And unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of people who have one. And so we get trampled on. Jesus made it very clear. He said if the salt loses its savor, he says it's of no use anymore other than to be thrown out and trampled on by men. And that's what happens. When you're flavorless, you're not good for anything other than thrown on the ground. That's basically what the salt was used for. And so what God would have for us is to simply embrace him. Now, I, I, I say this not because I'm a grumpy old man now, you know, I've told, I told my wife, I said, you know, eventually people are going to just look at that old cantankerous old man up there and just think he's just mean. And I felt this when I was 20 years old. I didn't say it quite, quite like I do now because I know a little bit more now than I did 39 years ago. But I feel just as firm about what I used to say when I was 20 years old as I do right now. Jesus Christ is real. The Bible is true. We need a relationship with God through him. That's not my words. Those are his. God has made promises to the nation of Israel. And as God has made promises to the nation of Israel, he said to them, listen, your enemies have had a problem with you. I want you to know I am going to deal with your enemies. You, Israel, are in exile at this moment. But I want you to know you have a beautiful future. Because in the still distant future, I'm going to do a work in you. And ultimately... You will come to faith in my son, Messiah, who will rule and reign over you. And the people will no longer taunt you. The people will now see that God is with you. And everything is going to change at that time. And so, of course, the nation of Israel looks forward to that time. What a blessed promise that God is giving. Now, continuing in verse 16, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land... and they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. 
When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I have concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. So Ezekiel reminds them they've been exiled. They were exiled because of their disobedience. They were exiled because of their idolatry. They were exiled because of their sinfulness. And, and when they were dispersed, and this is what's sad, notice it's found in verse uh, 20, when they were dispersed, they, they continued profaning the name of the Lord by their evil lives. And, and the people would see the way that they lived and would question what kind of relationship this people had with, with, with the God that they professed to believe in. And in and, and verse 21, notice how he says, I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Now, I want to make a point on that. That's the effect that occurs when people who claim to know God don't honor him. Pagans mock God. That's simple. Pagans mock God. Your God is powerless. They mock God. I don't know. Gosh, it sounds... Forgive me the way it sounds. I, I even... I hesitate to say what's on my heart because I know it, it's possible to be misunderstood. If you heard all the stories I hear, You'd understand the passion that I have when I stand up here and I share. You'd understand. When people say, oh yeah, I love the Lord, I serve God, and they're, and they're living in a way that is obviously against the things of God, living with their boyfriend or out there doing their drugs, or, and you name the sin, I encountered it. And people will say, oh, yeah, I know the Lord. Well, for me as a believer, and I want you to know this, I don't stand there making judgment on these people. I don't. I don't. I don't sit there going, oh, you terrible sinner. God knows if you point one finger at somebody else, you've got three pointing at yourself. I understand that. I do. And so I don't make judgments on people. I'm trying to share my heart with you, and I hope it makes sense. It won't to everybody, but perhaps some will embrace this. But it does grieve me. It grieves me because I know that that person that is claiming to be a Christian and living the way they do so far from God is making a mockery of God and his power to save. I had a fellow I used to work with prior to going to full-time ministry. He actually was a salesman who would come in and take my boss out to baseball games. My boss at that time was a, a Dodger fan, and when the Dodgers were in town and they were playing a day game, this salesman would come in and take him out to the game. And my boss would come back a few hours later. And he and this salesman had been drinking, and my boss was you know, he was always a little high, always. He'd come in with that big, you know, sloppy grin on his face and that silly smile, and he'd work over. But he was high, he was drunk, he'd been drinking. And he'd been drinking at the expense of the salesman who was taking him out, and we used to call it whining and dining, so he could keep his business. He would take my boss out, get him drunk a little bit, take him to a game, and then he kept his business. That's basically how he kept the business. And so I saw this. I worked there for several months, close to a year. I saw this happen more than once. Then one day, the salesman was in my office with me. My boss was not there at the moment. And, and I began to talk to the salesman. And I, as I was talking, I started sharing the gospel with him because he obviously needed the Lord. So I started sharing the gospel with him, and I talked to him about salvation, and he stopped me. And he says, I'm born again. And, and I looked at him, and I said, what? He says, I'm born again. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I go to church. And, he, and I said, and you take 
my boss out? He says, well, if I don't do that, I'm not going to get his business. And so we had a conversation. I don't remember it now. It's been 30-some years. But I do remember letting him know that if you're a believer, there are better ways to secure business. One of my co-workers, he used to be a pretty foul-mouthed kind of guy, same job site. He used, to, he used to be really angry all the time, and he used to use some bad words quite often on the job site. He and I were sitting down, and, and I said to him, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ can work wonders in your life. And I started to share with him. And he says, Dave, he says, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I'm born again. And I, I said, and your language hasn't been. <laughs> he says, well, that's no big deal. And I've seen that so many times, and I can go back beyond that. I can go back 39 years ago. We're at Bob's Big Boy, Whittier Boulevard in Whittier. One of my friends says, you got to learn to give away your faith. And I say, I'll just walk with you while you give away yours. Because I didn't know how to, I was once lost and now I'm found was pretty much all I knew. I was blind and now I see. That's about it. I'm a brand new believer. But we're there on Whittier Boulevard at Bob's Big Boy when my, my friend is talking to somebody and I look into this truck and there's a high school buddy of mine, Jeff. And I walk up to Jeff and Jeff is drunk as he normally was as I normally would have been with him. So we were good friends for a long time. And I said, Jeff, how are you doing? I haven't seen you. And he's drunk. He starts to talk to me. And I said, I just want you to know, man, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I've been born again. And I'm not kidding. He looks at me and goes, so have I. He was drunker than a skunk. That's an old phrase. Somebody said the other day, drunker than a skunk. Where'd that come from? I don't even know. The 20s, I don't know. Drunk. See, so I've seen this for years, and I, all I'm trying to say, all I'm trying to say is this, guys, listen. We need to really be aware of the fact that we very often are the only Bible people ever will take the time to read. We are the living Bible. Now, does that mean that I'm saying, so therefore we are to be perfect? Of course not. There's nobody in this room perfect outside of me. I know it. No. Of course not. What I'm saying is, can't we at least keep in mind who we are? Can't we remember that God, by His grace, really does change lives? Can't we remember that? Can't we remember at least one scripture like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and therefore, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. Listen, the difference between heaven and hell very often is in our power in this sense. We have a message that Jesus gave to us that can save somebody, and they can go to heaven. But so often, we just don't care that much. So it doesn't matter. And then we say, oh, grace, grace. And we use the word grace to really mean permission. I can continue in sin so that grace may abound. And Paul says, no, God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live any longer therein? If Jesus Christ actually saved us, he does transform us. And so God is upset here with the nation of Israel because even in exile, they lived such terrible lives that the nations that had them captive or encountered them were saying, there's no way these people could really be the people of God. Look at how they live. In verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my sake, for my name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. 
and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hollowed in you before their eyes. And so what he basically says, when it's all said and done, by restoring Israel to the land, I'm simply fulfilling my word. I made a promise back in Genesis 12, 7, uh, that to Abraham's descendants, I would give this land. And so I'm going to be keeping my word for my own name's sake so that it brings glory to me because I'm a God who keeps my word. Now he gives this incredible promise, and I've actually been looking forward to just spending a moment looking at this with you in verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. Nation of Israel today is not the nation God is speaking of in this passage here. The nation of Israel has begun to regather. We're going to see this in chapters 37, 38 as we continue on. But what we have is the foretaste of God fulfilling his word. The people he's speaking to are the ones who are, are regenerated, though, and that's the promise he's making, those who have become born again. He is saying, I... I I'm giving you a literal promise. I will return you to the land, the land that I gave to your ancestors. I'm going to be the one, he says, who regathers you. And I'm going to cleanse you from your sins. There's going to be a conversion. We can look at it as a national conversion. That's what he's speaking of in verse 25 when he speaks of sprinkling clean water. That clean water that he speaks of sprinkling upon them speaks of purification. It represents the doctrine of justification where God makes them as if they hadn't sinned. And God is going to wash them. They ultimately are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They are washed by the word of God and they are, they are sanctified by the spirit of God. And he's saying to them, I'm going to give to you something that you don't have. I'll wash you. I'll cleanse you from your filthiness, from your idolatry. And then he says in verse 26, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, this is what we need. It's not going to be a religious thing. It's going to be an act of grace, mercy. It's going to be God doing the work by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's, it's not an, an act of religion. It's an act of mercy and grace. It's God doing the work. I'm going to give you a heart transplant. I'm going to take that stony heart out of you, and I'm going to replace it with a soft heart, a heart that is soft towards me. That's conversion. I'm going to make you brand new. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to give you a new spirit. This, this new heart and this new spirit speaks of a new nature and, and that which is internal that empowers that nature. I'm going to give you an attitude, a changed life, a new birth. I'm going to make you brand new. That's what we need. I have a longing, I have an aching in my heart for this generation that's coming up. I realize that my generation, ministers like me, that we're all growing older, I realize that. When you start looking at some of the guys that you're all familiar with, and you start realizing that all of the Calvary guys that I know who are first generation Calvary chapels were all growing older, I know that God has given to us a certain length that we can use, be used by the Lord, but my great desire is should the Lord tarry to see a, a group of young men and women rise up who are going to take this gospel into their generation and continue serving the Lord and sharing his word with, with the generation that's, that's coming up. I have a great desire to see that, a longing to see that. I want to see a revival amongst the youth. 
See, when I got saved, I believed that the Bible was true, even though I didn't act on it. I didn't, I didn't grow up in a, an educational system that caused, caused me to question whether the Word of God was true or not. I didn't live in a time when it was taboo to say Merry Christmas. You know, when we had Christmas season, every Christmas, we actually had Christmas plays. We even in my school had Christmas songs. We as kids, when I was in the fourth and fifth and sixth grade, and, and, and obviously before that, we used to have assemblies where the kids would actually gather together and be taught Christmas hymns. We sang Silent Night. We, we sang uh, Away in the Manger. We sang that in the classroom. This is something that happened. There was prayer in classrooms when we grew up, and, and more than just praying before you had the test saying, God, help me. I mean, there was real prayer. And, and it was not a taboo to speak about Jesus favorably. I, I grew up in an entirely different generation, so I didn't have a problem with the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. I, I was raised believing that there is a source of truth. There is a God. He's very capable of, of, of making sure that His Word is transmitted accurately to me. I didn't have those questions. That wasn't something I grew up with. It's just a matter for me. Was, I just don't want to embrace that because I've got other things I want to do. Nobody had to convince me that it was true because I knew it was. It wasn't one of those things. If you came and argued with me and told me something, I might say something stupid to you, but in my heart of hearts, I, I believed that the Bible was God's Word. I was raised that way. My mom believed the Word of God was true. I never had a problem believing that. I knew that it was. I just didn't want to embrace it. But I didn't have an entire society that kept on saying to me, it's wrong, it's stupid, you're stupid if you believe that. I didn't have a teacher. I didn't have teachers when I was a kid telling me that you can't believe in creation because it's obvious that evolution is a fact. I didn't have that. We did not have teachers like that. As a matter of fact, if we had a teacher who said that, that teacher would have gotten in trouble for doing that, for attacking faith, because faith was important. See, so my generation grew up in a different way. My kids' generation grew up differently. They grew up with some teachers mocking Christian faith. And you go to college today, you've got professors who make it their aim to destroy Christian faith. They've got an argument against God, and they bring it out in the classroom, and you pay for it when you pay your tuition. So you have to hear the diatribes against your faith. You have to pay to hear somebody ridicule you. I get questions from college students quite often related to that. Pastor, what should I do? I tell them, do what I did. Challenge the teacher. Take them aside afterwards and ask them, do you think it's right for me to pay you to attack my faith? Do you think it's right that you attack the things that I believe in? And why are you doing that? Speak to them. Open your heart. That's what I did. Tell them what Jesus Christ can do. Let them know. You're, you may be the only witness there. So let them know. What are you afraid of? Getting an F? So what? So what? Tell them the truth. Because we have to. Because if we don't, who's going to? And see, God is saying, listen, I'm going to give you something you don't have. I'm going to give to you my spirit. I'm going to remove your heart of flesh, and I'm going to give you a, 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 a heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to give you a new nature. I'm going to give you... See, that is the grace of God. The nation of Israel is going to be given these promises. And this specifically speaks to them, how that God is going to have a nation that is absolutely regenerated. And he's saying, and I'm going to put my spirit in you, and you will keep my judgments. You will do them. Why? Because they're going to be written on the tablets of your heart. It's like that Jewish rabbi, that teacher, Nicodemus, who approached the Lord and said to him, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do the works that you do unless God is with them. And that's when Jesus said, listen, unless you're born again of spirit and water, you cannot enter, you cannot see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you're seeing something, but you have to embrace that by faith. You have to have a new nature. You have to be born again. And the fruit of being born again is instead of rebelling anymore, Israel, love and obedience will result because my spirit will be in you. And you, according to verse 28, will dwell in the land that I've given to you as a regenerated nation. Now, closing, verse 29, I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. Bring no famine upon you. I'll multiply the fruit of your trees 
the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. You will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed, confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they'll say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I'll do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, just a couple of thoughts. Notice in verse 31, he says, you'll remember your evil ways, your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Notice in verse 32, and he says, not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Interesting. I'll close with a couple of, a couple of thoughts. The root of humility, and humility is really necessary for us as believers. It's one of the evidences that we really know God. The root of humility is simply this. It's spending time with the Lord and beginning to see him for who he is and then seeing yourself for who you are. And the more you see him through his word and by his spirit and sometimes through the living evidence of those who love him just their character the fruit of the spirit in their life when you when you see the lord for who he is it causes two things and this is what he's saying here one it causes you as you see him in his graciousness towards you because keep in context he's saying to them i'm giving you a new heart and a new spirit what it does is it causes you to sometimes remember what you were. And when you remember what you were, it humbles you. For almost every day of the 39 years that I've walked with the Lord, for almost every one of those days, actually, I'll correct that. Every one of those days, for 39 years that I've walked with Jesus, at least once, most of the time, more than once, during the day, every day, for 39 years, I've remembered what I was. I've never forgotten. I will be reminded, but I do remember every day what I used to do. I do. I never forget. And the result hasn't been what some people say, oh, poor self-esteem. No, the result has been to grow in my love for Jesus, for his mercy for me. That's what Ezekiel is talking about. You're going to remember, and you're going to hate what you did, what you were. And I'm going to tell you something that some of you will understand and others you will learn. The more you love the Lord and the more you realize how gracious he's been to you, the deeper your thankfulness is. And the deeper your, your love for him is. It's like when Jesus forgave that woman who was the sinner and Simon the Pharisee, when she came in the room and began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and dry 
his feet with her hair and kissed his feet and anointed him and all that she did. And Simon, that Pharisee, was looking at her do that, and he was thinking if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. And when Jesus said to him, I have something to say to you, and Simon said, say on, and he gives the illustration of two debtors, one owing a great sum, the other owing a lesser sum, but both of them being forgiven for their debt, and then Jesus asked that question. I want to ask you, which one will love the one who forgave him more? And Simon says, I, I suppose the one who, was, who owed more. That was the whole point. And that's why Jesus points to that woman and says, do you see her? Do you see this woman? Because that woman was broken and humble and uh, adoring him because like Jesus said, she's been forgiven much, so she loves much, Simon. And, and listen, guys, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you see yourself. And the more you see yourself, the more you can realize, God, I'm no prize. And then when you realize you're not a prize, you can say, but you know what, God, you loved me anyway, and you've shown me grace and mercy, and as a thankful sinner, I simply just want with humility to serve you and be used by you. And now, you will loathe what you used to do. And I have to tell you, there are, I have some memories in me that if I had the ability to find these people I hurt, I would like to say I'm sorry, but I don't know where they're at anymore, so I can't. So I have to deal with it in my heart sometimes. God knows. And I honestly do hate what I did to other people. So much so it changed my whole life to try and do good to others because of the evil that I found so easy to do to other people. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, you know, when I give you the new heart and that new spirit and you know yourself for what you've been without me and you remember, it's only going to draw you closer to me because you're going to see God as saying how good I've been to you. And I took you, an exiled nation, and I brought you home. I repopulated a barren land. I caused you to prosper. I put my spirit in you and I will bless you and you will know that I am your God. And at one time you were mocked, but others will now say, truly God is in your midst. Because at one time, people would look at you as a nation and say, how can this be a nation that has been set apart for God? But in the future, when Messiah is ruling and reigning, people will say, indeed, this is the people of the Lord because my word will be in you and you will love me and obey me and you'll have the humility that demonstrates that you truly know me and I will bless your life.